let's talk about the president. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I played the mumble part of an angry, disjointed, outrageous amnesty speech that went 12 minutes. I, paid, I played the whole 12-minute speech so I couldn't be accused of cheap fakes. I used the C-SPAN. What did you think of the mumbling? What did you think of the amnesty? What do you think about just generally his mental abilities? Yeah, uh, I, I watched uh, the C-SPAN feed as well. And here's the thing, you don't have to watch the whole thing to see it get weird because the second that Jill Biden takes the mic, I was struck by her sort of introducing the policy, right? She's she's doing a lot of the heavy lifting here in a way that I don't remember Laura Bush doing. I don't remember Michelle Obama doing. Perhaps I'm incorrect about that and I'm being unfair, but it felt like her speech was, dare I say, more presidential than when she handed it over first to uh, uh, an undocumented Javier. immigrant, illegal immigrant, to, to speak, and then to Joe Biden, who starts off again with a lot of mumbling and oddness, thanking Javier for his help in the healthcare sector, and then saying, we've been in the hospitals a lot, my family, which I think is a reference to tragedies within his family, which is such a go-to and often awkward, weird reference for him to sort of shoehorn into things, uh, because I, I think he has a he relies on it sort of getting him some points as he starts some sympathy. Uh, the policy itself, I don't think he has the power to do this. Uh, I don't think politically that people have an appetite for amnesty right now. I don't think that's top of the list. I think their policies are incoherent. They're sort of swinging wildly between like. Oh no! I see that polls say people are concerned about the voter uh, about the border. So let's do some things that look tough there. But also, our base is going to be mad. So let's offer some amnesty that we don't really have the power to offer. But it'll take five years for it to get to the Supreme Court, and we'll have done it already. Which is not a great way to treat democracy when you're fighting for democracy, as they claim to be. Uh, but I can't see that this is a path to voters' hearts. This just seems bad. Mary Catherine, I think he's winning. I mean, Biden, I, I think Donald Trump is winning big and that they're panicked in the White House. And then this morning I, I read Israel's approved a war plan for Lebanon. The United States has cut off the F-15s to Israel. Bibi has taken to the airwaves and the reaction at the White House among the kids over there, they canceled all the meetings with the Israelis who are coming over to talk about the visit. It's like it's being run by children who live on Twitter. Yeah, I think you're right. You may be right about the panic because, look, you don't have a principal who is looks capable of digging himself out of a hole. And it looks like he's in a hole right now. Like, I I don't want to trust every single single poll or or an outlier that says something different. But we have a an established pattern at this point, even among non-white voters, even among young voters where they're like, in some cases, tied in battleground states uh, for Trump and Biden. Uh, Hispanic voters where Trump is leading. I mean, these things have got to be huge alarm bells for them. And yet they sort of just seem to flail about and claim these things aren't happening, claim the principle, uh, the president is prepared to do some like really rowdy campaigning and get himself back on the boards. Uh, and this is what you see generally toward the end of a campaign when the campaign realizes that they're in deep doo-doo, that's a technical term. Uh, but it's happening in June. I, I can't wait to hear the Getting Hammered edition where you go over this. But I got to do a quick veep stakes with you. Doug Burgum's coming up. Everything I know and have reported is he's at the top of the list. The other three names on the list are Glenn Youngkin, Mike Pompeo, Trump goes back and forth, and Tom Cotton as the new face, the military face. Of those four, who would you pick? I like Doug Burgum and Youngkin a lot. Actually, that whole list is pretty decent to me. Uh, and I would be the demo that you would want to convince to get on board by adding someone who I think is like, oh, that guy's a normal guy who was a governor and did the right things. Uh, I imagine that Trump respects Burgum and he seems to be like hanging out with him. Uh, Burgum has made a lot of money, which is a metric that Trump respects. And I think he's a good dude who put his money and his soul back into his state in North Dakota instead of going to uh, San Francisco to run his tech business. Uh, so that's an interesting choice for me. I'm not sure uh, how much Trump is into Yunkin. I love Yunkin. I'm in Virginia and I think he's a great governor uh, and would be convincing to people in my demo, but I'm not sure he's going to convince 
Trump. Uh, I'm not sure that's as good a fit. Uh, but I but I think there's potential for both of those. 